You know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, basically never seeing Asians on screen. And when I did see them, it was often in these very kind of minor and very stereotypical roles. And, you know, I think the book was me trying to wrestle with what this does, both internally, but I think also what it does to everyone else as well. It can have a warping effect. That was Charles Yu. He's the author of the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction, Interior Chinatown. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast from the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Charles Yu was a successful lawyer who was also a successful fiction writer. As he was lawyering, he published numerous stories, book reviews, and essays in magazines, an award-winning short story collection, a novel, and then television came calling, and Yu found himself writing for the first season of the HBO series Westworld, and then has spent the last five years writing for and producing other shows like Legion and Here and Now, and of course, continuing to write fiction. I think the career trajectory is important when you consider the premise of his novel, the National Book Award winner, Interior Chinatown. Written in the form of a television screenplay, Interior Chinatown is an insightful, funny, and searing exploration of Asian American identity and representation in popular culture. It tells the story of Willis Wu, who's doomed to play various generic Asian characters in a TV procedural called Black and White. And that omnipresent television set dictates the roles of everyone in the book based on their race, gender, and age. To call this limiting for the people involved is quite the understatement. And it's also at the heart of the book. Our hero, Willis Wu, wants more. He wants a story of his own. You know, Willis's job at the beginning of the book is, you know, specifically generic Asian man number three slash delivery guy. So he's kind of a utility player. He's very much a background character. He's the guy in the back delivering food or unloading a van. And he doesn't generally have any lines in the show. He doesn't have a story to say the least, right? So he's just kind of there as part of the scenery. And yet, you know, this book, what it, I was trying to do was imagining a narrative from that person who the story is very much not about. He exists in this show called Black and White, which is a police procedural. If you imagine, you know, CSI or Law and Order, some version of that. And it's called Black and White because there's one black cop and one white cop, and they are the, the leads of the show. They're the heroes. And what Willis dreams of is actually being part of the show in a bigger way. The highest level that he can attain as an Asian in the world of black and white is to become Kung Fu guy uh, and use his very sort of specialized skills of Kung Fu to be part of the action, basically. And so the book is, is about Willis trying to climb that ladder and what happens when he gets closer to the top and where that journey takes him. I know you spent a long time writing this book. How many years did it take? Uh, yeah, it depends on how you calculate it, but I would say more than six, less than seven. That's the question. When you began this book, is this the story you were trying to tell or did the story itself change throughout those years? That's a great question. I, I would say the latter. I think I didn't know what the story I was trying to tell was, and that was part of what took so long. I thought I knew, and I discovered it along the way. I think in terms of the actual prose, there were chunks of it that made it from the beginning to the end. Some of those kernels were like the backstories of Willis's parents were there pretty much from the first draft. But the story itself didn't have a form yet. I, I didn't know how to write it. I, I couldn't hear the voice that it should be written in. And it's almost like I was trying on different outfits, you know, and none of them fit right. So it, it wasn't until more than four years into the process where the current form actually presented itself for whatever reason. And that's when really the writing started to happen. When you decided, okay, I'm making this a screenplay. Yes. Yeah. You know, it wasn't so deliberate. It was more like I heard the first lines of the book and I thought, oh, you know, that's interesting. That That felt like not me just 
rehashing the same things I'd been trying for, for, for years at that point. <laughs> it, it felt like, oh, I hear a voice now. I, I got a sense of the tone and who Willis was. And then from the, from the fact that Willis was an Asian actor came a bunch of other choices. Like, well, if he's an actor, is he in a show? And if he's in a show, does that kind of dictate the form of the book? Well, as you said, black and white bears more than a passing resemblance to Law and Order or CSI. And of course, we've all seen episodes of those shows that are set in Chinatown and they occur, what, once every other year or something like that? <laughs> that, that was my memory. I mean, it, it felt like it. And when Willis is lucky enough to get a speaking part... The cringe-worthy lines that he is forced to say with an accent, even though, of course, he doesn't have one, having been born in the United States, you know, we've all heard those lines. It's a question of family honor. They are so familiar to us. And I'd like to talk about that familiarity because I do think in a lot of ways it's at the heart of this book. Yeah, it is. And I'm glad you highlighted that it really was kind of the original thing that I was trying to get at. You know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, basically never seeing Asians on screen. And when I did see them, it was often in these very kind of minor and very stereotypical roles. And, you know, I think the book was me trying to wrestle with what this does, both internally for, you know, someone who has to watch that and say, okay, that's the representation of me or my family or my community, but I think also what it does to everyone else as well, which is when, when you only see certain groups in this very limited, sometimes physical location, like a Chinatown setting, and you see them speaking with accents or you see them doing martial arts and all of their storylines have to do with some sort of cultural difference or some sort of horrible secret, you know, that, that dishonored the family it really skews the perception, right? I mean, for many people, this might be the main way they interact with Asian Americans is through these stories. I mean, if you don't live in a big city where there's lots of Asians, you may think, oh, that's interesting. This is a sort of like window into this community. And, and I think even if you do, it can have a warping effect to only see this kind of story. So, you know, I think that's really what I was trying to do is take that story and investigated from the inside. Right, because it's like the TV show that's America. Um, and all of us having assigned roles, and some of us are at the center of the story. And as you put it so beautifully, the light on the set hits our faces just right. And then others remain the unnamed guests. Right. Yeah. It's partially comes from my actual experience on set and partially comes from being a viewer. But I think after having worked in TV, I even got a, a sort of more specific and deeper look into how much goes into making that reality. You know, how much attention is paid to how well the, the stars are lit. I mean, literally, most of the time you're sitting around on set is actually lighting set up to make sure the shot looks beautiful or looks how it's supposed to look. All of that attention is paid to these details. And then, <laughs> meanwhile, you're telling a story that isn't at all like reality. So that kind of disjunct is, to me, sort of both disturbing, but also, in a weird way, amusing that, you know, you can be paying all this attention to basically the plausibility of this fictional world and at the same time be getting something else, like, egregiously wrong. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, of course, you wrote this book before COVID, and I read it during the pandemic and during the rising violence towards Asian Americans that the pandemic has unleashed. And the book and the issues it raises are just so tragically timely. Yeah, they are. The book came out in January of last year. And as I was basically finishing a short book tour, the world was shutting down. You know, of course, at the time I was writing it, I would have could never have guessed that we would see the kind of wave of anti-Asian sentiment that we're seeing now. But that said, there's a sadly a kind of evergreen quality to some of these ideas and themes, because even though this idea of the China virus or Kung flu 
okay. is new, it taps into something pretty old. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why it has resonance. Yeah. Yeah. Your procedural is set in, of course, a Chinese restaurant, because why not? And it's called Golden Palace. And Willis and his family live in an SRO above the restaurant. For those who might not know, what is an SRO? An SRO is single room occupancy. And it's essentially, you know, you you rent a room maybe by the week, maybe by the month. And there's a shared bathroom down sort of at the end of the hall in a shared kitchen area. Essentially, it's like a, a dorm for either individuals or potentially families. You see this sort of arrangement in Chinatowns. And it also functions for me in the book in a kind of fictionalized way as the place where all the Asians are kept, you know, when they're not being, you know, when they're not playing the extras. It's like, okay, when you're done with your day of work as sort of the background players on this show, they all go live there. And it's very much backstage, you know, in the, in this story of like, this is where they really are and they live their lives and they're human beings here. And then they go on camera and they're sort of playing these flattened versions of themselves, these roles as Asians. I really appreciated the scenes in the SRO and the way the book explored the struggles of, of people and their poverty and the various ways people in poverty cope because you don't see a lot of poverty in literary fiction. You just don't. Nobody ever has to work as far as I can tell. And it's so important, I think, to understand economic struggle and the way it can compound racial inequity. And, you know, they're interlocked frequently. Yeah, I agree. You know, I wanted to write about these characters in, in sort of all of their dimensions, them as human beings, as bodies who have to eat and who have to, you know, clip their coupons and figure out, um, you know, what they've got left at the end of the month. I mean, at least up until very, very recently, it's sort of impossible to imagine telling that version of like the Chinatown story of like, what's it like for, you know, the shopkeeper who's actually worried about making the mortgage or paying the bills. And that was part of the dimensionalizing of these characters as, as human beings. Willis, you know, wants to be Kung Fu guy. That's really what he wants. And then he's realizing as the book unfolds that Kung Fu guy is really just another Asian stereotype. And for him, deciding to be a father to his daughter really serves as his come to Jesus moment with that, I think. Yeah, I, I think the way you framed it is really helpful. It's essentially a decision between two roles. You know, as Willis gets more successful within the system of black and white, he finds, one, that it's not all that it, he maybe thought it would be in terms of glory or feeling like he's made it. It, it comes with its own trade-offs. But as you said, the key really is that it, it's just another role. Even though the, the pay is better, the visibility is better, he still very much has to play by someone else's rules, and he's still just as constrained as he ever was. And at the same time that's happening, another role is kind of emerging for him, which is to care about someone else, and, and specifically his daughter. So I think the, the book, even though it starts out in a place where Willis is very much trapped in a role defined by his race, I hope and I think it expands to incorporate so many other roles that he plays, you know, as a son, as a father, as a husband, as a member of this community. Very much. Disappointing son. Good son. I mean, you know, the son even has a multiplicity of roles. Right. You break out of the screenplay at moments, when, especially when we get the backstory of his mother and father. It's pretty much in narrative form, though it's framed by scene headings. And I thought that was a very moving part of the book. Did you do research as you wrote this story? I know your parents were both born in Taiwan. Yes, they were, and they did immigrate. And some of the, I guess, tangent points are somewhat very, very loosely based on, you know, stories they told me about their own time coming over from Taiwan to the U.S. in the 60s. So there was some research, I guess, just in a family sense, talking to them, interviewing my parents, and just trying to learn more about what it was like for them, what they felt, things that happened to them. And there was also, you know, some legal research, you know, especially towards the back end of the book. As Willis goes deeper into the history, it doesn't just focus on his own familial history, but he learns more about the long struggle 
of Asians in America in, in terms of trying to secure rights. You know, in a lot of these court cases, they're basically trying to figure out Asians, you know, how can we analogize them? Like what minority group are they close to? And so for Willis, that's part of his education as well. Were you surprised by those laws? You have them in, I want to call it a preface, it's called exhibits and it's before court scene and it's the timeline of laws. Were you surprised by this? Did you know about all these laws or was it a discovery for you as well? It was a discovery. I was surprised. I mean, I'd had a vague awareness of, you know, the major ones like the Chinese Exclusion Act and of course, Japanese internment and the 65 Act, which actually opened things up because that's actually what allowed, you know, my dad to come over in 65. So I kind of knew, I guess, some of the highlights, but what really surprised me was kind of the number and scope of so many of these laws and also learning about a lot of the anti-Asian resentment that happened, especially along the West Coast, where basically Asian workers had been brought over as cheap labor and it caused a lot of conflict because they were seen as basically taking jobs from people. There were massacres, you know, of Asians in Washington State, in California, elsewhere in the Western U.S., you know, over 100 years ago. This was already happening. So as I got deeper into some of that, it did surprise me. Interior Chinatown is a book that deals with, as we've talked about, very important issues, very serious issues, often in a tone that's really light and playful. Talk about that interplay and that juxtaposition. Yeah, I, I think... For me, that was important in the writing of it. In order to keep writing it, I had to entertain myself first. You know, if I start to get bored, I definitely stop because I think if I can't keep my own interest, then what, what reader is going to want to stay with me? That's always a good rule of thumb. <laughs> um, and so I don't think of it as like I'm writing punchlines or trying to make someone laugh, but I, I am aiming for a tone, as you said, to one, to not take myself or the book too seriously, even as it gets into some heavier subject matter, because I think there's people better qualified and to, to probably write the serious version of some of these things. I wanted to bring whatever sensibility I have and also just experience as a TV writer, just to come at it from that direction. So yeah, it was mostly just a practical thing of like, this is how I know how to write. And so this is how it comes out. And at the same time, though, you're not afraid of emotions or deep feelings, because there are moments where it's funny, and I'm laughing. And then there are moments that are so piercing, it just took my breath away. When Willis was taking care of his aging father, and you have a line where he realizes that he's still his father, but he's not his dad anymore. Oh, my God. I mean, people of a certain age will absolutely know that feeling. It's so profound. Thanks. Yeah. I um, When you say people of a certain age, I'm like, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I agree. You know, my editor, Tim O'Connell, calls it kind of revving my engine when I'm sort of just writing sentences, but not really getting to the heart of the matter. And then sometimes the gears actually engage. And it's usually when I'm writing towards something that hurts, you know, it's like, oh, I know why I was avoiding this. It's because I don't like the way this makes me feel, you know, like, <laughs> and then I have to keep typing because that's when the writing is actually starting to happen. Well, we, we mentioned it's a screenplay, but man, you really went the whole nine yards. It's formatted like a screenplay. It's even in Courier font. Yeah, right. Uh, which was, you know, a choice that I had some anxiety about, to be honest, because it's not the prettiest font, but I just felt like to go the whole nine yards, it was all or nothing. You know, it, it was like I, I, the form of this was so important to me in the writing of it. And, and I think as a reading experience for people to say, oh, I'm really in this, you know, um, and what it does sort of visually and what it does for the sort of narrative to be able for Willis to jump in and out of the story quickly, right? For And for the reader to follow Willis as he jumps in and out of the story. Early on, I thought, can I really sustain this for a whole book? But I knew I had to try, so. Well, you've had multiple careers and you began as a corporate lawyer. I want to know how you made the shift to writer. Yeah, slowly and then all at once. <laughs> 
so I was writing for most of the time that I was working as a lawyer um, up until just a few years ago. I graduated law school in 2001 and I started working. And that's actually the same year I started writing fiction. So I was publishing stories. I then got to publish a couple of books. And then a few years ago, I was working in-house as a lawyer for a technology company. And I got a call asking if I'd come meet, you know, for this job on a TV show. And, you know, it wasn't completely out of the blue because I had started working with an agent for like TV and film rights. But it was somewhat unexpected because I hadn't actually been thinking that I could make that shift. But for whatever reason, I think they were looking for somebody who could tell a story in a, in a more serialized way. Maybe they're looking for someone with, who could just pitch ideas, I guess. And so I got the job and that's when my wife and I had to talk about it because it was, you know, it's a scary thing. We have kids and a mortgage and would we have health insurance? All these kind of practical things were part of the decision. But, you know, I made the decision to leave the law then and I have, you know, since been lucky enough to keep working. You've been doubly blessed by the National Book Foundation. Earlier this year, winning the National Book Award for Fiction for Interior Chinatown. But years ago, you were chosen by author Richard Powers for their Five Under 35 Award, which is given to a younger author whose debut fiction shows extraordinary promise. That was an amazing moment for me. I still remember when I got the email. I was at work and... You were lawyering. I was lawyering. Yeah. And at the time we had only had our first kid. She was, I guess she had just been born. And so what happened was a few months earlier, my very, my first book came out as a short story collection. And, you know, as debut short story collections go, it did all right. And it got a couple of reviews and major publications and I was thrilled. But honestly, you know, after a few weeks, the book just slips under the radar as books do. Right. Uh, and so I was kind of thinking, will I actually ever write a book again? I was, you know, somewhat discouraged because it just felt like, you know, a miracle that it had ever happened. And then I remembered I had gotten a, a sort of negative review in the New York Times, which was a bummer because I had been so excited to find out the book was going to be. Anyway, all of which added up to this sort of doubt that I'd ever do it again. And then I find out that Richard Powers had picked me for that, and which was incredible because I had read him in college and, you know, I admired his writing greatly. And it was just this huge boost of validation of like, okay, well, if Richard Powers believes in me, then I, the least I could do is try again. <laughs> so uh, I did. Well, you were at HBO and you, you worked on Westworld and you went on to work at other networks and other series. But I wonder when you wrote Interior Chinatown, were you thinking of those writer's rooms where you had been in and sort of your position there? And were you able to advocate for a more nuanced or subjective representation for Chinese Americans, in particular Asian Americans in general? Yes and no. You know, I was thinking about it after it became clear, oh, I'm going to really try to do this in the form of a script. Then I, yeah, then I was like, oh, wow, the, all the experiences that I've had over the last few years came in handy. You know, I, I could, with some limited sense of authority and more just knowing the specifics of how things actually work, what it's like when you're trying to make a show, what it's like in the room, the decisions that go into that in terms of the writer's room. And so that was fun, you know, actually getting to map one world onto the other, you know, and use all those tools and, and the forms and techniques, I guess. So in terms of being in the room, I'd had generally a pretty good experience in terms of rooms being run by people that were interested in inclusion, in being sensitive to cultural authenticity. I, I've worked on some shows where people are really listening and, and well-intentioned and trying hard to make sure that they don't fall into some of the same traps that TV has in the past. So that said, I think it's more structural. You know, it's like, these are all stories that I'm not the one who created it. I don't get to tell that story. And so there's only so much I can do. I'm really writing in service of someone else's idea. So yeah, I mean, it was a somewhat limited influence I could have in, in anyone else's room. Well, that leads brilliantly to my next question, which is about the differences in process of writing for television as opposed to writing fiction. I mean, TV is so collaborative, whereas with a the novel, there's you and a page and, or the screen. And I get there are editors, but it's really your work. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's both the freedom and the terror of being completely in charge of the domain of my fiction. I mean, maybe not completely. I guess my editor would probably take issue with that. I mean, it's it's collaborative in the sense that, you know, I have a couple of really trusted readers, my editor and my agent. But yeah, other than the two of them, you know, you don't have to think about, is this filmable? You don't have to think about budget or location or actors. You just think about where can this take me? You know, it's, it's language and it's ideas and it's spaces that don't have to be physical or tangible. And so in that sense, it's a completely different kind of activity than, you know, the very real and practical activity of writing for screen. Did you miss the collaborative process that comes with television? I mean, I do. I miss that. I miss people. There's a lot of fun with it. I, I think it, there's this cool thing that happens sometimes in a room where you see someone pitch an idea and you're like, that, where's that coming from? And, and then it sort of gets kicked around. And a few pitches later, you realize that it's kind of grown into something, but only through the group activity, the, the random walk from one mind to another, it, it ends up getting you to a place you never would have sort of imagined. And so that's really cool. I, I try to import that a little bit into my fiction is like imagining the voices of some of my coworkers. Sometimes it, it lasts for a little while. And then after a few weeks, I'm just left with my own, <laughs> my own <laughs> voice inside. I'm alone again. You won the National Book Award and you were so clearly stunned, but gave this speech that was really joyous and so lovely. You know, you won it during a pandemic where folks couldn't gather, but at the same, then you could be with your family. I, I think it was kind of bittersweet, no? Yeah, it was. You know, we clicked off the Zoom, you know, and then I was just with them and we had a pizza and, you know, I think it was really neat. You know, I, and that wouldn't have happened if it had been in New York where it usually is. Yeah, of course, it would have been really fun to get dressed up and, you know, go with my wife to New York and actually be grown ups and, and, and of course, meet all of those other writers. That would have been really cool. But I, I think in a year where everything, where reality just completely got turned upside down, it, it seemed like a fitting thing, both to win something that I never would have dreamed was possible and then <laughs> to win it on my laptop in my house. <laughs> Okay. And, you know, here's the question. What are you working on now? Um, and you can say nothing. <laughs> no, it's definitely not nothing. Uh, okay. I'm working on uh, a number of things. So one of which is the a TV adaptation of Interior Chinatown. So that's for Hulu. And, you know, I'll have to try to figure out if I can come up with a device or a bunch of devices that make the show work in the same way that, or, or maybe not in the same way the book worked, but in a way that translates it from page to a visual medium. That's great. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Thank you for writing this book. I liked it enormously. I thought about it a lot and thank you. Well, thank you for reading it and for this conversation. I really appreciate it. That's writer Charles Yu. We were talking about his National Book Award winner, Interior Chinatown. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Stay safe, and thanks for listening. <laughs>